Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our gospel service. We're going to commence our time of praise now this evening, and the first one we're going to sing is, Jesus, keep me near the cross. Next one we're going to sing is my heart is filled with thankfulness to him who bore my pain who plumbed the depths of my disgrace and gave me life again just want to read from Galatians 1 chapter and verse 4 and just with that thankful heart we remember the one who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this evil present world according to the will of God our Father. Let's sing this one out with a real thankful heart and praise unto the Lord this evening.
The next one we're going to sing is Fairest of all the earth beside, chiefest of all unto thy bride, fullness divine in thee I see, wonderful man of Calvary. one of our prayers as I was sinking deep in sin sinking to rise no more overwhelmed by guilt within mercy I did implore
Well, that was a great time of praise, praising the Lord this evening. We're going to open now our service tonight with our opening hymn, Dear Saviour, Thou art mine, how sweet the thought to me. Let me repeat thy name and lift my heart to thee. We'll stand to sing after the introduction, please. that brings into our hearts as we journey through life to say, I know thou art mine. Let's bow together as we just come to commit ourselves to the Lord in the attitude of prayer. Let's pray for ourselves, those who'd love to be here and can't be, and remember also everywhere else where God's word will be preached. Let's seek God's help and blessing. Father, we count it a great privilege again tonight to be able to come into this building to lift our hearts in praise and in worship to you, the great triune God. We come as always in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and we thank you that in him and through him and because of him we have immediate access right into the very courts of heaven by faith. What a joy it is to know tonight so many of us these lovely words we have just been singing together. Dear Saviour, thou art mine, how sweet the thought to me. Father, there was a time when 
We knew nothing of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was a time when he didn't figure in our plans and he had no part in our lives or in our homes. But we thank you for that day whenever the Spirit of God awakened us to see our great need. And when we bowed our heart and our knee in repentance and we confessed our sins and we put our faith and our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. For some of us that wasn't long ago. For others that was very long ago. And yet our Father throughout the years that we have known the Savior, never once have we known him to fail us. He has been with us. He has encouraged us. He has continually kept us on the way. And so tonight we come to give you our heartfelt thanks for the Lord Jesus Christ, for the faith we have in him, and for the great hope that we have, not just in time, but for the whole of eternity. Thank you, Father, for the time we have spent already in your presence today. What a joy and privilege it is to come out on the Lord's Day morning to fellowship with those of like precious faith, to sit our Father and listen to your word and to meditate upon it so that we might be encouraged to keep pressing on the upward way. And Father, what a joy to remember our Lord Jesus Christ in his own appointed way, to think that this man, the Son of God, who knew no sin and did no sin, was willing to be made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Many of us can say that the Son of God loved me. He gave himself for me. There's something very personal about this. We know our Father, we can sing mine, 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 not on the basis of anything that we have done, but simply on the basis of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us on that old rugged cross. Father, as we gather together just now, we come to pray your blessing upon each one of us. We thank you that you're interested in us individually, whether we're here in the building or sitting at home listening in live on Facebook. We thank you that you want to meet with us. We thank you that you want to speak to us. And so we pray that that will be our experience as we meet here this evening. Remember, Father, everywhere else where your word will be preached, this our Father is often referred to and is St. Patrick's Day. And we remember, Father, how that we learned of him and how that he came to bring Jesus to this land of ours. And yet the truth is this land of ours in a large extreme has turned its back upon the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that wherever your word is preached, there will be signs following the preaching of that word and that there will be many who will come to know the Lord Jesus as their Savior. Remember our Father, we pray tonight those who are laid aside at the moment, we commend them to you and pray for a full recovery for them. Think of those in hospital, those at home. We think of those, our Father, in residential care. Some of them are still able to remember the days they spent here and what a blessing it was to them. We pray, our Father, as they think about us tonight, that they might know that we're thinking about them. So hear our prayers and continue with us. We ask as we spend this time in your presence and with each other, and we ask it all giving thanks in the worthy name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, it's lovely to see the building so well filled this Sunday evening. Can I take this opportunity to give you a warm welcome to your evening gospel service at Bambridge Baptist Church. We welcome those who will be tuning in live to the service on Facebook this evening. And if you're visiting with us, we give you a special welcome. Pastor Taylor will continue his series, Lessons from Dr. Luke, and the title this evening is The Rich Young Ruler. After evening service, we'll have the Youth Fellowship at 8 p.m. over in the church hall. And then also after the service, there will be a praise group practice. Just the announcements for the incoming week, Monday, the warm room continues from 10.30 a.m., 
through to 12.30 p.m. Then on Tuesday, the toddler group at 10.30 a.m. And on Tuesday night, the Good News Club at 6.45. This is the last Good News Club of the seasoning. I shared this morning, listening to Ivan and Dave, it's been a wonderful time sharing God's word and building relationships with the children. And this Tuesday night, the term will finish with a family and fun night. There will be over 40 families coming on Tuesday night, so please pray for that event and Ivan as he brings the closing message. They have 14 children from P7s and they hope that they will move up into the JYC. So continue to pray for all the work that's been done on a Tuesday evening and where we see much fruit. On Wednesday, our prayer meeting and Bible study, Pastor Taylor will continue a series with Exploring Ephesians. And then on Thursday night, we have the annual general meeting, the AGM, and that's at 8 p.m. over in the church hall. If all members, please remember to bring your voting slips on the night. If any member has anything that they would like to discuss at the meeting, it needs to be with me before I leave the building tonight. On Friday, our Bible study at 12.15 with our elder Woody Price, and then the youth club on Friday evening at 7.30 p.m. through to 9.30 p.m. Then next Lord's Day, the 24th of March, Sunday school and Bible class at 10 a.m., 10.45 for prayer meeting, and 11.30 a morning service on breaking of bread. The children's talk next week will be Alicia Baxter, children's church will be Ali and Lindsay Farrell, and children's crash will be Valerie and Arm Bell, and Rita Lindsay. Gospel service is 6.30 p.m. and Pastor Taylor will be speaking at both services next Lord's Day. The singer next Sunday evening will be Joy Boyd. There will also be a members meeting on Wednesday the 27th of March after the prayer meeting. So members, please take notice of that members meeting. These are all the announcements on the red subject, always to the will of the Lord. Well, there's no singer tonight, but we're gonna sing Another one, just before the pastor comes and brings the word of God this evening. I hear the Saviour say, thy strength indeed is small. Come to me, I'll be there, stay, find in me thine all in all. Just to look at that, I was thinking about this tonight coming out and just reading the chorus. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left that crimson stain, he washed it. Why this? Now, what actually brought us to the verse that the pastor read this morning around the Lord's table? And I'm just going to read it just before we sing this hymn. Come now, it's in Isaiah 1, verse 18. It says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as well. Let's sing this hymn in praise to the Lord this evening.
Amen. Thanks, Mark, for leading us in our praise time. You ever thought of what that will mean when one day you stand before the throne faultless, faultless in the presence of Christ? What a day that will be. Turn with me, please, as we come to the Word of God tonight, to Luke's Gospel, chapter 18. <clears throat> Luke's Gospel, chapter 18, and we're going to read from verse 15. <clears throat> Luke 18, verse 15. And they brought on to him, that is Jesus, also infants, that he would touch them. But when his disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. The certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good, save one that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother. And he said, All these have I kept from my youth up. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing. Sell all that thou hast and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they that heard it said, Who then can be saved? And he said, The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Then Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house or parents or brethren or wife or children for the kingdom of God's sake who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. God will add his blessing to this reading of his inspired word. You may remember the last time we had been looking at these verses here in Luke chapter 18. We noted the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. And of course, the Lord Jesus Christ told this parable for the sake of those who were righteous, who felt that within themselves they were good enough to enjoy a relationship with God. And obviously, the Lord Jesus Christ had the Pharisees in his mind. But he speaks about two men, very, very different men, two different people spiritually and socially. And Jesus reminded us how that they came to the temple to pray. But how they came and how they prayed revealed to us much about both their characters and their conduct. We noted the conduct of the Pharisee, a man who held a position of domination within a group called the Sanhedrin. They were a group of people who were totally in conflict with the Lord Jesus Christ. Very often when Jesus would be ministering his word and when he would be healing and doing all kinds of miracles, these people were right in his face and there they were trying to get the Lord Jesus Christ to fall. And in some measure, they were wanted to see the Lord Jesus Christ 
uh, see him coming to that place where they could get him confused about what he was doing. But that didn't happen. On this occasion, a Pharisee comes. He identified himself as a Pharisee, at least Jesus did. And this man came into the temple and he stood and he prayed and he told God how good he was. Unfortunately, though, many of the things that the man did were true. This man was very sincere, but he was sincerely wrong because he couldn't see his true state in the sight of God. The second man who came in was a man we refer to as a public and a man deeply resented by so many people in society. He was a cheat. And like other publicans, he demanded more money from the people than they were obliged to pay. But this man, very differently, couldn't even lift up his head toward heaven. He simply prayed, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And I love this story and I love this man because he acknowledged his sin before God. He accepted what he was in God's sight. He confessed his sin to God and he simply threw himself upon the mercy of God. And if any one of us are ever to be saved, that's the way it has to be. We have to acknowledge our sin before God. We have to accept what we are in his sight. We need to confess that sin to God and turn from it. And God in his mercy will never turn away those who come to seek forgiveness for their sins. Tonight we come back to these verses in Luke 18 and we're looking at a very interesting young man. We refer to him as the rich young ruler. Let me put these verses for a moment in context for you. The Lord Jesus Christ had been speaking about children and the important place that they should have in life. And these children were brought to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we read that the disciples were very agitated about this. They wanted them to be removed. But then Jesus said this, Suffer little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily, I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. And almost immediately, as the Lord Jesus Christ speaks about the worth and the importance of little children and the need for a childlike faith, a young man comes to him and he comes to the Lord Jesus and he asks this question. Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? That's a great question, isn't it? So I want you tonight to look at what happened here. Listen to the conversation between the young man and the Lord Jesus and see what we can learn for our own spiritual good. Firstly, this young man had an earnest desire. I think it's fair to say that when this young man initially came to the Lord Jesus Christ, this young man had an earnest desire to have some serious questions addressed. And there seemed to be one in particular that had gripped this young man's soul. He said to Jesus, good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, interestingly, in Mark's gospel account, Mark relates to the same story, and he tells us that this young man came running. And he came and he throws himself down at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ to ask a question that was obviously important to him. But it's a question that is important to every single one of us, irrespective of our age tonight. This question must have been burning in the soul of this young man. To come running, to come to the only one he knew could give him an answer to his question. He comes to the Lord Jesus and he said, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Let me say this immediately. 
This is a very important question for all of us as we sit in the meeting or as we sit at home listening in. Anything to do with eternity needs to be considered carefully. So often we talk about life, and rightly so, and every single one of us want the best out of life. If that's what we want, Jesus said, I am come that you might have life. And many of us have been in the road here living for a long time, some not so long. But the point of the matter is that every single one of us, whoever we are, whether we're saved or unsaved, whether we're young or whether we're old, Every single one of us one day will go out into eternity. So the question that this young man asked the Lord Jesus is a question that every one of us do well to consider this evening. You look at this man for a moment. You'll see he had a good upbringing. He's not asking this question to catch the Lord Jesus Christ out. That's what the Pharisees did. That's what the scribes and the Sadducees did. They followed Jesus. They hung on every word, hoping Jesus would say something that they could attack in order to defend the law. But Jesus never did that. But this young man comes. He's not trying to catch the Lord Jesus Christ out. He's trying to understand something of vital importance for him. This is not a petty question. He's not trying to put the Lord Jesus Christ in a difficult position. He comes with respect to a man who he recognizes to be a teacher. This young man had a good upbringing. Obviously, he had been greatly influenced and impressed by the law of God from a tender age. He knew the commandments. He knew what God demanded of him. He knew that obedience was going to have to be something that comes into the equation, but he wanted to work this out. And when Jesus asked him the question and responded to the question, the young man said, all these have I observed from my youth. You want me to obey the commandments? I have already done that. Imagine a young man, and here he is, and he knows the law, and he has obeyed the law, and he has fulfilled the law as best as he can, and he's still not right with God. Can I say this tonight just in passing, by way of encouragement to those of us who are parents, those who work with children, those who work with young people, Never underestimate the importance of teaching the Word of God to children and to young people. You might say to me, well, Pastor, I do it and I love doing it, but it seems as if they never listen. How do you know that? They can be going home from meetings and thinking about what you said, just as this young man thought often about the law and what was required of him. No matter how young they are, no matter how disinterested they are, you keep praying, you keep working, you keep teaching, for the Holy Spirit can take the Word of God and apply it to the hearts of children and young people. Do you know, I heard the other day about over a hundred pastors gathering together for the annual pastors' conference. The speaker who was over to speak at the conference did something I've never seen done before. I wasn't at it, but I heard about it. He asked all the pastors who were there and all the missionaries who were there and all those who were come along to the conference if they would stand up. And they all stood up. And then he said, if you're someone who was saved at six years of age, sit down. He went through year by year, six, seven, eight, nine, right through to the end of teens till he came to the age of 20. And out of the hundred and so many pastors there, there were just seven still in their feet. Most of them 
in their Christian work were saved as children. Never underestimate what the Word of God can do in a child's life. Here's a young man, great upbringing. And here's a young man who would consider eternity. Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Don't understand what this young man understood. You and I may see things differently today with all that we have in the Word of God, but whatever was going on in this young man's life, he knew death was not the end of his existence. He knew there was something beyond the grave. Now, some of us might sit here tonight and say, well, what a silly thing for a young person to do to think about eternity. Live the whole of their life ahead of them. Look at all that they could do in the years leading up to old years. Look at all how life is spreading out before them. So many prospects, so many things yet to do. Why on earth think about eternity? Well, for the reason I've already stated, that whether we're young or whether we're old, one of these days we're going to be in it. We'll leave this scene of time behind. It happens every single day because the thing about death is this, and it is death that will carry us out into eternity. Death is no respecter of persons and has no regard for age. Children, young people, older people and all those in between. Face death and go out into eternity. That's why I'm saying to you tonight, whoever you are, if you're unprepared, you prepare for the great eternity that is yet to come. You make sure that you're saved for I would not ever want that you should be lost when you had the opportunity to be saved. You say, but pastor, I'm one of those people that thinks I have the world at my feet and I have so many years and I have all the plans for the future, a future that's not yours to claim. And I'm asking you tonight, lovingly stop and think about your life and where it's heading. About death and where it will take you. And about eternity and where you will spend it. Ah, some of you might say, Pastor, listen, I know you and I respect you and I have heard this so often before, but you know, I don't believe in all this nonsense about heaven and hell. Well, there's a day coming when you will. There's a day coming when you will. And you'll either be in heaven or hell for the whole of eternity and no hope of change. That's why the hymn writer says, where will you spend eternity? This question comes to you and me, tell me what shall your answer be? Where will you spend eternity? That's one of the most important questions, if not the most important question you'll ever be asked. You need to answer it in time because in eternity it'll be too late. This young man had an earnest desire. Good master, what shall I do? to inherit eternal life. Secondly, this young man enjoyed an enlightening conversation. Do you ever think to yourself sometimes when you read through the Bible and you read about the individuals that came to the Lord Jesus and you see the Lord Jesus sitting up there on the mountain, thousands gathered around him, and you heard the Lord Jesus Christ speak. What a privilege that would be. This young man met with him face to face, no distractions, no crowd, just him and Jesus. And he asked the question, good master, 
What must I do? Teacher, how will I have eternal life? And Jesus gives the young man the answer. His response is clear, simple, and positive. But if a young man was serious about these issues, he had come to the only man and the right man who could give him the answer. For he alone has the words of eternal life. He listened to the young man speak about his upbringing, how his attempt was to keep the law. And then verse 22, Jesus says this. When Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, yet lackest thou one thing. Sell all that thou hast, distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. Jesus loved this young man. I thought there's no doubt. But Jesus made it abundantly clear to this young man, listen, you cannot be a disciple of mine under pretense. He loved him and he told him clearly what was demanded of him if he was to have eternal life. And you note the words that Jesus uses. Come, follow me. This isn't the first time in our way through the book of, of, of Luke, that we have seen this particular statement. Remember how Jesus speaks about discipleship on a number of occasions. He says in Luke 9, 23, if any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. And this young man was interested. He thought about eternity. And Jesus said, if you want eternal life, come and follow me. Nothing could be more simpler than that. Despite the fact this young man had a good upbringing and had a commendable life, it was clearly not enough. He had tried earnestly to keep the commandments and he was still not right with God. But Jesus told him how he could be. Come and follow me, which simply meant for the young man, he was to follow after Christ. He had to meet the demands of discipleship. Jesus says, you put your faith in me, your total dependence in me. Don't depend on anything. Don't depend on anyone else. Trust me. Because in me, you'll find the eternal life that you're thinking about. And if this young man really was concerned, interested, thinking about eternal matters, Jesus alone could give him the life, the eternal life that he longed for. You see, if you're serious tonight about eternity and where you'll spend it, you have to come to Christ. You have to follow him. You have to meet the demands of discipleship. If you're interested in salvation, want to know your sins forgiven, you'll have to come in simple, childlike faith. And put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And rest your all, not on who you are or what you've done or what you want to do for salvation, but just put your all on the Lord Jesus Christ who died your death at Calvary. There's no other salvation apart from him. You'll never find salvation in anyone else but him. Friends, you and I, sinners by birth and practice, no matter how commendable our lives might be, have the same need as this young man. You might say to me, oh, Pastor, hold on a minute. You know, I'm not young anymore. I've got older in years, but I've been in this church. I've sat in another church. I have done everything I could. I know my religion off by heart, and that's the problem. This country is full of people who know their religion off by heart, but don't know Christ. It's not religion that saves you or that saves me. It's Jesus. Jesus. 
through his death on the cross, where he died for our sins, where God took your sin and mine and he bore them all away in his own body, and there on the cross, punished for our sins, paying a debt we could never pay, and doing for us what we could never do for ourselves. That's why the little hymn says, come to the Savior, make no delay, here in his word. He has shown us the way. Here in our midst, he's standing today. And he's tenderly saying, come. Sometimes we complicate all that we say regarding the gospel. Jesus said to this young man, come. And follow me. This young man had an earnest desire, an enlightening conversation. And this young man was faced with an important decision. He'd come to Christ. He was the man to talk to. He was the God man, the man who had come to seek and to save the lost. He'd asked his question, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus answered the question simply, specifically, and in order to meet his personal need. And here he is. He knows the answer. He knows the outcome. He knows what he needs to do. And now he has to make the most important decision he'll ever make regarding his life, regarding his soul, and regarding his eternal destination. That very moment in time, as he knelt before the Lord Jesus Christ, he had to decide either to take Jesus at his word or reject him. He either had to prepare for eternity or leave it. Or he had to have his life and values transformed or else he'll do nothing and remain as he was. Look what happened. Look at his choice. He had the world at his feet. He was a prosperous young man. If things worked out well for him, he could increase his wealth, have everything money could buy. On the other hand, if he had all of that and the one thing he desired most he didn't have, and that was eternal life, he'd be a lost soul. And he had to ask himself the question, what will I do with this man? Look at his consideration. I'm convinced, absolutely convinced, that this young man didn't only listen attentively Grasp what Jesus had said. He gave careful thought to the whole matter, weighing it up, looking at it, considering it. And then he made his choice. Maybe that's where you're at tonight. Maybe that's where you've been now for weeks or months. Sitting in this meeting, perhaps sitting in other meetings. Still not saved, but knowing the way. Still know Christ, but recognizing on the cross he died for you. Still no decision, and yet a step, a day, a week, a month, years nearer eternity. Friend, let me ask you tonight, if the Lord Jesus Christ stopped you in the pathway of life and said to you what he said to this young man, come and follow me, what would you do? You say, Pastor, I'll tell you what I'll do. I did it last week and I've done it for all my life and I'm going to do it again tonight. I'm going to go home. I don't need Jesus. Well, I'm going to tell you this. If you don't need Jesus, then what do you have for eternity? That's the thing. If you don't have Jesus, you have nothing. If you don't have your faith in Christ, you have nothing. And one day you'll have to consider that 
and your choice will have to be made, and there's no better time to do it than right now. His choice. Look at his consideration. Look at his conclusion. These must be some of the most tragic words recorded in Luke's gospel. Luke 18, verse 23. When he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. Or puts it even more tragically. For he says he was sad at that saying, and he went away grieved, for he had great possessions. He made his choice. He, he wedded up my gold and God, my future in heaven with Christ or my future in hell without him. And he made his choice and he made the wrong choice and he went away grieved, sad, disappointed. Not because he didn't know the way. Not because he hadn't thought about eternity. He went away grieved because he wouldn't follow Jesus. He wouldn't follow Jesus. What will you do tonight? Will you do the same? You've got the desire to be saved. You know the way you can be saved. You know where you're going if you make the wrong choice. What tonight will you do with Jesus? Somehow when you count the cost, you're not prepared to change. Can I say this before I close and may the Spirit of God write it on your heart? If you know your need, if you know Christ alone can save you, if you know what awaits you in the lost eternity, what is it that stops you from coming in faith and taking Jesus as your Savior? It better be worthwhile in life But it won't matter in eternity. It will not matter in eternity. And you need to be careful with the choice that you make. I hope you'll choose Christ. Tonight you'll put your faith in him and that you will be prepared for eternity. Let's sing in closing a lovely hymn just as we close. Is there a heart that is waiting, longing for pardon today? Hear the glad message proclaiming Jesus is passing this way. Don't miss him. Come and put your trust in him.
pray together. God speaks to your heart tonight. You're going home thinking about these things. Talk to a parent. Talk to a friend. But don't put this matter off. Because life is short and death is certain. And eternity is waiting. Please, put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ that you might have eternal life. Father, thank you for this story recorded in your word of this young man who had eternity on his mind. And yet when it came to it, He wouldn't take the step of faith. He wouldn't follow Jesus. And he went away sad and grieved. Grant that that will not be the experience of anyone tonight, but that they might come and put their trust in Jesus and have this eternal life that he has come to purchase through his death on the cross for sinners just like us. Thank you for today. We commend every aspect of it to you. We pray for our young people tonight that God will bless their time together. And we pray, our Father, as we leave this place and make our way home, that you will go with us and that you will bless us throughout another week if you spare us to see it. And all these things we ask giving thanks in the Savior's precious name. Amen. Amen.